So my name is Diana. I think that I've met most people in the room, probably. Um, for those of you that don't get to attend the Mother Daughter Weekend, I'm usually a presenter at the Mother Daughter Weekend. So I'm a daughter with Hyper Lady, so don't go to the Mother Daughter Weekend. Make it that fun. Anyhow, so positive caregiving, my objective with this conversation is to talk about caregiving, all types of caregivers, what being a caregiver means to you. And can you raise your hand if you're the parent of someone with type one? Okay. And how old? 13. 13. 14. 14. 14. 14. 18. 16. 16. And it doesn't have a kid type. No kid type one. 16. Okay. And um, talk a little bit about what positive caregiving is, and then really try to harp on care, care for the caregiver, which is super important and we always forget, and then have a discussion. So really, feel free to interrupt me. So caregivers, we don't have to go over this in depth, but there's all kinds of caregivers for your kids with type 1 diabetes. There's roommates, there's siblings, there's parents, there's grandparents, there's um, best friends of parents, there's their best friends, and everybody has a caregiving role. So it's not just parents of people with type 1. There's coaches, there's teachers, there's mentors, there's psychologists, you know, everybody has a caregiving role. So I wanted to look a little bit at what the formal definition is of caregiver. So Merriam-Webster, I just Googled it, comes up with this definition. A person who gives help and protection to someone and a person who provides direct care. Does this capture your guys' experience as caregivers? It doesn't encapsulate all the worry that we experience. Okay, so it's missing the worry, the emotional toll as a caregiver. What else is it missing? The what? The conflict. The conflict, okay. The argument and all of that that goes into your role as caregiver. What else? What's a big thing that it's missing as a caregiver? The stress that you feel? Yep. What else? As a caregiver. What's maybe the biggest piece of caregiving? The <laughs> guys. The time. Hello. 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 <laughs> Really not that sophisticated. 
And, and then this also extends to the caregiving that you give to each other if you're in a relationship, um, a romantic relationship. Higher marital quality equals more support, which also leads to better management. And this is supported by research, but this is also just like, duh, it's obvious. A lot of the psychological research is like, really, you're just validating what we all know and we've all experienced, right? Okay, so um, the caregiver experiences and different roles. So lots and lots of different types of experiences and roles, and some are positive and sick, some are negative. So I want to actually, before you read that, what do you guys think are some of the positive roles of the caregiver? Things that go well, feel good, help out, and what are some of the negative experiences and roles as caregivers? Bonding. Bonding? Okay. That's positive. <laughs> cooperation on both sides so feeling like as you're giving care you're also getting thanks oh my gosh who gets thanks for the care that they give yeah well, you can make a difference yeah so seeing some change and, and shaping someone's life wow like as a parent what bigger deal is that than to shape the way that you see that their trajectory is going their life is going yeah you see results So really, when we when we think about positives, we think about all the partnerships in care. And I really like how you said there's two sides to that story, and that's a partnership. So we think about the collaboration, the support, the um, the feeling. We always use this word as psychologists, self-efficacy. It's just a fancy word for feeling like you can manage it, that you can do it, that whatever big hurdle is in front of you, you can break down and figure out how to do. Um, feeling helpful, being able to monitor and not feeling like a nag. And then the negatives of the caregiver experience, which I think we've all experienced as either parent or spouse or mentor, is feeling burnt out, feeling completely overwhelmed and burdened, feeling really worried and doubting yourself about your ability to care. Um, sleep is one of the biggest concerns of caregivers because with a kid, or a young adult that has type 1 diabetes, it's hard to sleep through the night because you're up worrying or checking and feeling isolated, which I think is one of the main things why I support and love Heart Dance so much is because it reduces that isolation and knowing that you're not alone in this experience as a caregiver. Any others that are missing on this list? time commitment with how much caregiving goes into diabetes in particular yeah and how it takes time out of other things that are precious and important in your life you have to learn to be a really strong advocate absolutely where where are the ways and roles in which you advocate schools coaches just you know everybody that's not me yeah so you not only have to be the caregiver supporting your team, but then you also have to be the caregiver supporting the caregivers that support your team. And so then you're in this very weird dynamic of being the medical educator when you not you, you didn't really go to school maybe for that. Maybe you did, but maybe you didn't. much on David where he can't do it himself, but sometimes I feel like because we're there for him, yet then he relies on us so much, and then he doesn't do what he should be taking control of. Like tonight, he would run late at breakfast, he said, okay, so we'll do this when you get home. He didn't say that he's totally out of insulin until we get here, and his pulse is beeping. So I'm like, uh, so he's like, okay, I'm just going to ask Dad to give me insulin. Okay, yes, I get that, but where is your responsibility in doing your part? You can't drop it. There are people who do every single role. I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm totally, totally different. I totally get that. But at the same time, am I making him more reliant on me? And yeah. not so much on himself, yeah. 
So it, it's like this, this like balancing act, yeah. which I feel like. Because when we go overboard, <coughs> he's like, I'll manage that. And then if we don't do much, then he's not doing what he's supposed to do. So the more you pull away, the more yes. you feel like there's corners being yes. cut. And then the yeah. more you are on it, the harder it is to... Because then we're in his face. Right. And I think you guys are speaking to the developmental trajectory of diabetes or any sort of chronic condition and what shifts and changes across the years. What are the expectations of a nine-year-old, a 10-year-old, an 11-year-old, an 18-year-old, a 21-year-old, a 35-year-old? And those shift and those change. And it's hard to readjust your own caregiving role as those things shift. Because you get used to something and you get good at it. And that's just our nature. We get good at it. So maybe we are good at waking up overnight and checking overnight. And then, you know, your 17 year old is like, whoa, what are you doing in my room overnight? Like, get out of my room. And you're like, oh my gosh, I have to recalibrate because this is not working anymore. Um, I don't know what to say in particular, but I do know that research actually shows on average that young adults compared to their teen counterparts, other young adults without diabetes, those with diabetes are more responsible, um, interact better with adults, and are have the same quality of life that they report, feeling like their life is worthwhile and meaningful, as their um, non-counterparts, people that don't have diabetes. So it may feel like you're doing a disservice by doing all this stuff because they have diabetes. However, research in aggregate at least shows that they actually become more responsible human beings than their counterparts. Eventually. Eventually. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it makes sense too, because you think of like a little kid, like a nine-year-old that's interacting with adults all the time, right. talking to their doctors and understanding these complex things that other nine-year-olds might not do. Yeah, and then I think what hit it for us, David's been as, he's a junior this year, so now we're like starting like the college educated early and you know getting those visits in if you're in a clinic that has a transition coordinator if you're not you can still try to get those visits in with the transition coordinator at the only clinic in the Bay Area that has a transition coordinator you can do that too um, <laughs> I started that program but um, but yeah like learning early so that you're facilitating the things that he'll eventually take on on his own and so this is the kind of um, cycle of stress and burden and burnout which is really really common if you're not I mean I won't make you raise your hand, but just think to yourself, has there ever been a period where I felt burnt out by diabetes? <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand, but you can if you want. Yeah, and feeling exhausted by the management, like the constant pressure, and you know, really wanting to help your child or your young adult and not knowing how, putting your foot in your mouth all the time, and, and really just feeling this burden. So the caregiver stress is sort of, um, not very good, or is my eyesight not very good? Sorry. Oh, okay. okay. So caregiver stress this is the, the vicious cycle. So you have all this responsibility, and so you're waking up overnight to check, and then you're feeling like, oh my god, I can't even believe the numbers are what they were. Then you're fearing the low blood sugars, and then your child is acting out, and then you're feeling stressed, and then you're feeling all this stuff. So it's like a vicious cycle of stress and burden. Um, what do you guys do when you've realized, oh my god, I'm feeling distressed, I'm feeling overwhelmed. There's a signal going off in my mind. This is too much. What do you guys have? You have what? You pray? Absolutely. Praying is something that I hear often. Asking for help, figuring out a way that makes sense to you to get support. What else? Talking to other parents helps. So seeking out that support. 
creating organizations where you make hair extensions <laughs> for guys. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I did that. Mm -hmm. I was like to say that too. Yes, well. <laughs> and being in my yard or go for hikes, so being out in nature and being active. Yeah. So taking a break, taking some time. What else? What do you guys do? Put you on the spot. Is there anything that you do when you notice that you're just feeling overwhelmed? You don't ever feel overwhelmed? One of your coping strategies is taking it, taking the information, dealing it with the day. I believe that there's no such thing as bad days. Absolutely. So I look at it that way. Okay, I'm facing it, whatever it is. Yeah. It's okay. I'm going to do it. And this is, yeah, this is actually where we're heading. And um, I think it's, it's a lot easier when people's brains work algorithmically. My brain is not super algorithmic. I, I don't actually remember numbers very well either. But um, when you have that attitude, like, this is just information, I can react to this information, and now I'm gonna get up the next morning, and I'm gonna get new information, I'm gonna react to that information, it's a really positive coping strategy. I think it's harder for others that don't have brains that work that way that are like, oh my God, what did I do? I saw this high blood sugar, and that's diabetes fault, right? That's not your kid's fault, that's diabetes fault. Then I have all this worry and all of this fear, and then I'm nagging, blaming, asking, shaming, saying, what the heck is going on? Then your teens are feeling discouraged, overwhelmed. Then they stop checking because it's easier to just stop checking than it is to deal with your nagging. And so then they fudge the truth or whatever. And so if they're not checking as much, then when they do check, it's going to be a high number. And so again, this is another vicious cycle that we end up getting into. And it's really hard because when you're keeping up your part of the deal, like I won't nag. Oh, nag, I won't ask. I'll just trust that I'm keeping up my part of the deal. I'm here if you need me. And then you feel like your teen's not keeping up their part of the deal because you somehow happen upon a meter or something and you're like, oh, there are no checks in here for the last week. Then what happens? Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> what happens with your wife? And, and, you know, the less information they get and the more ashamed they feel, the less likely they're going to want to get more information, which is a really hard thing to wrap our brain around because, it, it, you know, we can say all we want, like, it's just a number, it's just a number, and it is just a number, but it's not only punishing to get feedback from the people that are caregivers, it's also punishing to get the feedback from the meter. Like, I did everything right today, and I still see us HI. Or I did everything right today and I'm still chugging orange juice because I can't keep up with everything because I was at work all day and like pushing things around and they were heavy and my numbers are dropping. So it's not just punishing for the caregiver side, it's also punishing from the information that you get side. Do you guys have good strategies to talk about the numbers? I think with, um, and it's especially uh, an issue now with puberty and just kids being all over the place is crazy. But remembering to kind of get out of myself and that this is his long-term thing that he's going to have to deal with and however I respond is going to influence what his feelings are about his long-term mm -hmm. self-care. So um, just never, never having any emotion show at all, no matter what. And there, I used to be a teacher, and there's this guy who um, his whole uh, philosophy 
was upset is weakness when you're teaching. Like, you know, mm-hmm. like, shut up to all the kids. It's you're showing your weakness, and then you're just an honor. And I kind of applied that with my son. Like, if I if I show any upset, then what's you know, there we are down the drain. And so just tw- focusing really hard on this is his experience. I'm secondary to it, and. Yeah. What else? How do other people, because this is something that comes up over and over again. I know what I do is I train and I just was at, um, in Southern California at a big diabetes conference where um, I was telling the providers in the room that were getting their continuing education, um, really, 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 there is no good A1C and no bad A1C. And they were like, oh, come on. I'm like, no, really. If you don't know what the numbers are, then you don't know what changes you want to make. And so if you scare people into not wanting to come in and understand what the numbers are so you can make those changes, you're not going to be able to even get them through the door. They're going to feel so negative about coming into your office that they're not going to listen to anything that you're saying. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. And so then I, because like, it's funny, because I, I do these talks a lot for parents and parents of young kids as well as kids. And I always say, think of, think of the, the meter as a stoplight. Who here gets really angry when the stoplight turns red? Well, sometimes you, because I'm driving along and I want to get where I'm going to go and it turns red all of a sudden and I'm like, ah, damn it. But then I'm not like sitting there yelling at the stoplight, feeling badly about the red light, like feeling like, oh my God, I'm a horrible person because I stopped at this red light. I'm just like, okay, it's red, it's going to eventually turn green. And when it does turn green, then I'm going to be able to continue on where I'm going. And so thinking about your meter as, you know, you have things that are over what you want to do so you need to stop and pay attention to it and do something differently things that are like slow down because you might be heading in a direction that you don't want because it's a number that's going to give you information then you have you know we're coasting and things are all right and so yeah you may be less stressed and less worried but um it's not that it's good or bad it's just information which is really really hard Um, and it's really hard for your teens because most often in the teens years they're not seeing anything close to 100 ever and so then they're like okay there it goes again there it goes again there it goes again so they're already feeling punished by it much less having conversations about it and so this is sort of talking about what you were talking about these changing roles and changing dynamics you know as a parent of a young kid or an early childhood kid you are the diabetes manager as the caregiver as you have an adolescent you're the monitor and supporter And that means there is this gradual shift, but there's a whole lot of coaching. So it's not like your adolescents are able to just do this all on their own. Well, first of all, their brains are not done and performing. And this whole part of their brain, that's the most important part of planning and making good decisions and not taking risky behaviors and risky actions, is actually not there yet. And it doesn't actually come in until the mid-20s where it's fully formed. And so the executive functioning skills that really are key to diabetes and planning are not there. Like, hey, three hours from now, I'm going to be after practice and in a car DM event, and I'm not going to have any sort of insulin. It's not actually like, I wouldn't expect him to be able to do that. I would expect him to be able to put some reminders in place that might help trigger that. But I wouldn't expect his brain to be like, aha, this is what I'm thinking about right now. So in the beginning, it was a little bit easier because he was younger, it was, he just did it as a result. And then as he got older, we tried to give him a little bit of independence and but not back away, obviously. So he was playing football and for two weeks straight now, he's had to get pulled down in the second half because his numbers were too high. And yet, we haven't figured out that what we did the previous week happened the next week and we haven't looked at, we might have changed that. And then I would say, well, we probably need to do, and, you, and I try not to say you need to and not put it on him and tell him, okay, how about we try this? And, you know, if you're going to eat before, maybe we should not eat this and start checking much earlier in the day so that by the time halftime comes, you know, and, and that's, I think, what's hard when I, when I watch him, he's like pacing back and forth on the sidelines, and you can tell he's pissed. And everybody he wants to be in the game. game. Yes, right. and it's so hard like because like I don't want to do that I told you so because that's not because yeah. of it doing any good but it, at the same time I'm like I mean we just did this last week yeah and now we're doing it this week and the worst part about that example is that he could have not eaten and dosed appropriately but because he got nervous and
And he's one of those kids that when he exercises, he goes up. He doesn't drop. He yeah. goes up, and then we drop weight hours later. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so, and that again is like so. Back to that one circle of um, whose fault is that? It's not his fault. It's diabetes' fault. His pancreas kicked out on him, right. and is no longer adjusting according to whatever is presented to him in the moment. It's not his fault. But helping put things into place that might make the experience a little bit easier for him is absolutely a goal. But he may always be the kind of kid that spikes when he's mm-hmm. nervous about a game and there's like a big something exciting in his life that's happening. Yeah. And so then, you know, how you manage that is going to be better and better and better over time. Well, and then it doesn't help that when the coaches see that and they don't, they don't understand it now because he's the only, the only one on the football team. So then they tend to be much more conservative as soon as they see that he's, you know, he probably could go and just, he probably needs to just put a plow through. Yes, and plow through it. But they're trying to do their part and I don't, I'm not going to go, no, you need to let him play because if something does happen, you know, I, I get that. But it's just, it's very frustrating to watch him get so frustrated because then later on then that frustration, you can't even talk to him about that. And the part about adolescence and the monitoring and supporting is like, um, who here has been fooled by the height of your child? I was because my stepdaughter was really tall, really fast. At 12, she was already 5'9". By 14, she was almost 6 feet tall. She looked like a human. She was not a human, but she looked like one. And she and they talk very well. They have good vocabulary. They sound like adults. And they can carry their own, especially when they're not around you. They're around like your friends or other people that they're trying to impress. And so it is really hard to figure out what your coaching role is and what your backup role is because they talk a good game, but then their actions are like, I remember like she used to, she literally used to leave her gum, like her chewed gum, like out, like right there. She's like, at some point you took it out of your mouth and then you made a decision to put it on our furniture and then you walked away. Like there are a lot of steps that happen there. And, and she was like, well, well, you know, she didn't know what was going on. So, um, so thinking about your role as coach, doing things like even granular things like, okay, I know this sucks, but you're 17, you're gonna go to college, we're gonna call insurance together. You're gonna be on three-way, you can be completely silent, but I want you to know, press one immediately, press one immediately, because then you'll be on hold for the next half hour, you don't press one immediately. (laughs) And so you're helping them by scaffolding their, their, their experience, just like if you were in your first job, you would not be thrown into something that you didn't know how to do all on your own. You would also not likely be talked to like a child, like, why are you doing that? What is wrong with you? Didn't you think through this? You know, you would be trusted to a certain extent, but coached from another. And so I say to all parents of teenagers, um, you cannot trust that they're doing what they say or don't say that they're doing, absolutely. But there are appropriate ways to be in the wings and monitor the things that are happening. And maybe that means if it's, I don't know if you guys are as conflictual as some of the other families I work with, but maybe it means that after they go to bed, it's it's you checking their meter and revising how the day went. Maybe it doesn't mean saying, how, did you check? What's your number? Did you check? But it's like sliding it over in the morning across the room and without words, letting them know that you're thinking about it and that it's their time to check. And then you don't have to follow up about what that number was. You can just say, everything, everything cool? You know what you're going to do? or need any help, and they can sort of say, no, like, it's fine. So using the nonverbals can sometimes help get away from the conflict. But you can use that strategy with significant others as well, um, because sometimes you get into these loops where you're like, I told you, and I told you, and I can't believe you're still not doing this. And so you're just kind of like, you know, sometimes when Corey is high, I'll just like slide the water bottle <laughs> over the table and be like, you want some water? And he's like, yes. <laughs> And then it sort of transitions to your role as being the safety net. So then as young adults and adulthood and beyond comes on, you're that person on speed dial that, oh my God, I can't believe this. I went on a work trip and my lantis all went bad. And I don't know, I was in Hawaii for some reason because I have this awesome job. And um, and I didn't have a refrigerator in my air, and the air conditioner went out. I don't know, whatever. What should I do, mom? What should I do, dad? And you're kind of the safety net, but you're not the go-to person to be managing all of the activities. All of the time. So supportive backup, as um, talking through things, as providing love, but the roles do shift over time. And 
Have you guys seen a big shift from your vantage point with where you're at? You're kind of in the middle. Yeah, but I kind of, my child wants to have much more responsibility than she's ready for. She's ready. She really wants to just do it all by herself. And you bring up a good point, is that um, just because there are ages doesn't mean that people developmentally are ready or less ready. Like, just because a kid is 18 doesn't mean that they're ready. Just because a kid is 16 doesn't mean that they're not ready. But, like you're saying, maybe her, her desire and her energy and enthusiasm is there. Just like if your kid was a gymnast and they're, like, really wonderful, but they're probably not going to the Olympics, but they're, like, super excited about it and think maybe they are. And you're like, wow, there's a reality check here. So what can your role be to scaffold her success, helping her develop her independent skills, but maybe recognizing, you know, her need for the support still, her need for the... I don't know if she resents my involvement. She just wants to be calm and stuff and give her suggestions too. But she wants to be able to do it all by herself. But I think, no, she can't do it all by herself. Yeah. And I think that this is not unique to diabetes. Usually this is not the only thing that teens resent us over. Unless you have a magical (laughs) team. That's the only thing she doesn't want to. Does she want you involved in her love life? Well, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just kind of the the age where that's what you do. It's important to like put up barriers against your parents. I I firmly believe it's it's important. I I can't teach my kids math. I don't even understand my kids math. But it's important. Well, I understand it, but I can't teach it to them. Yes. And I, I think that the more teens I see and the more time I've experienced lots and lots of teens, it's like, it's genetically, it's evolutionarily um, important that they become ornery. If they are super pleasant all the time and love you so much, they will never leave. <laughs> they will never leave. Like, so it's, it's sort of evolutionarily protective of them to become a little bit like, ah, like, and you're like, ah, because then it helps prepare you for the eventual separation in some cultures, which is later, that's okay, and some cultures, which is earlier, but that they are developing these skills. So it is very important that she's able to say, this is mine, and this is what I want to do, but it's equally important for you to say, great, I understand that, but I need to make sure that if it's not done, there's a contingency plan, and I'm that contingency plan. So how can I, you know, be on the sidelines, but make sure that it's happening? There's a lot that it helps. There's a lot of freedom and flexibility and feeling like you could have a more natural life where you're doing things and you don't have to constantly be, you know, oh my God, I just gave myself so much insulin, I have to eat all of this food. You're like, okay, I'll I'll dose out accordingly. Um, But there's also this idea that there's too much information sometimes and there's alarm fatigue, alarm and alert fatigue on both of the systems. There's all of this anxiety and worry in seeing every five minutes what is happening and wanting to act like act on that. And then again, because of this developmental trajectory and in adolescence, it is natural for teens to want more privacy and more secrecy because they are trying to explore things that aren't comfortable to explore around their parents. I don't want to know intimacy stuff. Like, okay, yes, I want to know, like, in terms of safety, but I don't, like, want to know details about, like, yeah, no. Mm-mm. But um, but there's this then open portal to getting all of this information constantly, and I think that if you guys don't have agreements in place and you have the share, it's a great time to make an agreement of how can I be supportive and helpful and scaffold in the way that's the the center box, not the I'm managing everything, I'm not managing anything. Um, How can I scaffold? And maybe that's, okay, mom, um, I am okay if you have seen my like very low alert go off three times and you haven't heard from me in however many minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is that you agree, I am okay that you call me. But if I responded to it and you have heard from me, then I'm not okay that you call me. So each family has a different system in place. You guys, have you guys, are you guys all techie people? Yeah, we text. It was over 300. We text. Right. And, you know, and sometimes you text it. Yeah. 
And sometimes the texting are words, and sometimes they're gestures, like um, like thumbs up, question mark, high five. Or, you know, sometimes teens really don't like words. Like, I don't want to explain to you. I don't know what's happening. Um, so they just like to know that you're there. But like, like, teens are, I don't want my mom checking every five minutes and wondering and asking questions. And for your kid, he's like, my mom was already asking questions every five minutes. And so now I'm glad that she's only asking Same. questions when something really bad is happening. And so I know that I don't have to pay as much attention. Yeah. And so it really is totally an individual thing of how technology works for you. In our household now, as I'm that third box, which is not the um, managing and not the uh, like helicoptering, but more of the like safety net, we've worked out that when he's traveling and alone in a hotel room, he turns on the share because he likes to know that someone else may wake up to the alarms. And that's totally comfortable. But when he's not traveling and we're like here and maybe he's nervous or, you know, in front of five teenagers, <laughs> like, oh God, um, that he doesn't turn on the share because he doesn't want my help and input. And so each of these things are, are iterative to work out with your family. Okay, so um, benefits despite the challenges, so finding the positive. If your teens feel safe and comfortable and that it's not going to be the end of the world to say, oops, I made a mistake and I didn't handle that the best way that I should have, but I, I want to fix it and I need some help, then you're gonna be more likely to feel like, okay, like I'm not gonna shake you because I think you're gonna potentially die from something that you've done that's a mistake because you need a lot of mistakes in order to reach the finish line. Um, luckily for you, adolescence is filled with a lot of highs and not as many lows. And so the margin, the delta, between something that's really fatal and the way you're responding as a parent and something that's actually fatal is pretty high in adolescence. Not great, I'm not saying that high numbers are great for extensive periods over long amounts of time, but their margin of error to do something about it, they're usually not dosing and bringing their blood sugars way, 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 way down during adolescence because of puberty and how their bodies are responding to insulin. So you have a little bit of wiggle room in order for them to show you that you can trust them. And it's all, I think, about the communication and how they're delivering the things that are not going well in order for you to start getting confident as a manager that things are moving in the right direction. But it takes time and it takes patience and it takes conversations that are sometimes difficult, but really important. So I think it depends on your kid. But for like little kids, things like, oh, can you like, can you carry the supplies? Or can you run and grab whatever it is? Or um, let's all guess, play that number. What's that number game? And so sibling, you know, whoever is closest gets some little treat or surprise. But including them and remembering that there is a lot of worries and fears that siblings have as caregivers and as people that love their siblings. They worry, they see mommy and daddy stressed all the time. They worry about, they hear these things about health and outcomes and things. And they're like, gosh, you know, is there something really bad here or something really wrong? And so having conversations with them also about health and about the health of the family is really important not to forget our siblings. And then finally, my computer is gonna die. Um, caring for the caregiver, it's super important for you guys to take care of yourselves. It's important. I say this and everybody says, yeah, 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 I know. But it is important. You, you can't do this all alone and you need to have support systems outside of your family. You need to have support systems inside of your family. You need to think about when your like tea kettle has gotten, oh, I died. Um, gotten all the way to the boiling point, what your contingency plan is and how you can get some respite. And, I think it's easier in certain circumstances to figure out and harder in others, but I work with every family that I see, even families that are experiencing severe amounts of stress on how to build in a bit of time away and time for yourself and time to focus on yourself. Because if you're not doing that, you're not being a good role model for your kid. And you don't want your kid to get all consumed by diabetes all the time and be so distressed and burnt out that they can't deal with it. You want them to be able to manage and when they see their tea kettle is burnt, like boiling over, that they're able to take a step back and be like, you know what, mom, I need help this weekend or whatever it is. So it's a good, being a good role model and being, and being good to yourself. Questions?
questions, thoughts, ways you guys have gotten respite or support or help? I call Tamar. You call Tamar. <laughs> A lot of people send, <laughs> send kids to camp. Oh, I love camp. Yep, camp is awesome. It's important they for were teens yeah. to connect to other teens, for parents to connect to other parents, for adults to connect to other adults, because it is a very isolating and very demanding chronic condition that 